1968, and I live in Los Angeles. In 1968, there were only 11 prisons in the state of California and 28,000 people incarcerated in their walls. You know, at a very young age, uh, there was a workbench in the garage at the home that I lived at. And I recall getting underneath that bench and hiding and my older brother would have his friends in the garage and they would be talking about the interactivity of the gangs that they belonged to. And I remember, you know, at that time thinking, wow, you know, I really wanted to be a part of that. And uh, I also recall thinking, wow, I just wanted to come out from underneath that bench and just say, you know what, use me. Here I am, put me to work. And uh, boy, did I long for that day to come. Yeah, for me, it was different. Uh, my mom was never at home. She worked all the time. She worked from 7 in the morning to 3 at night, then from 3.30 to 11.30. I played baseball, I played sports, but my mom never came to any of the games. She could never come. If she ever came, she would have recognized and realized that my uniform was different than everybody else's. She messed it up. She bleached them. <laughs> but, you know, I look back on that now and think my mom tried her best. She did everything she could. But the truth of the matter was, I was alone. I was always alone. You know, that day finally did come for me. In 1980, I was heavily involved with the gang. And uh, the gang activity that I was involved in, uh, I was arrested for multiple uh, robberies. And uh, I took a, a plea deal that back then. And uh, a part of that, that deal was a five-year sentence. I went off to do that sentence and uh, I took that plea, and, uh, but little did I know that years later, that plea deal would come back and bite me in the backside really hard. It's different for me. I went to high school, graduated high school, went to college, played sports, and then uh, started recreationally using drugs. Cocaine, then crack. Before I knew it, I lost everything. I knock on my neighbor's doors, lie to them about anything, lie to my parents, lie to my brothers, lie to my teachers, anybody I could just to get involved with that drug. I couldn't, I just had to have it. And I tried everything. When I looked around, I was just stuck with nothing. It was just me. So, you know, I committed a couple of robberies. When I got there, my public defender said, hey, you've never been in trouble before. You went to school, you got a good record. Don't worry about it. Just take this deal. It's just a couple of robberies that mean nothing to you. Those robberies now really, really hurt me. By 1994, the prison population in California was up by 500%, and the state was embarking on a prison construction boom that would result in 20 additional prisons, and at its peak, 170,000 people would be incarcerated in those institutions. Politicians were trumpeting about personal safety and violence, but it wasn't until a personal tragedy that befell the class family that the California, the state of California converged around the three strikes law. It passed in California, spread to the federal government, and ultimately 26 states would pass versions of the three strikes law. But what Californians didn't know was that unlike other states, in California, you could be sentenced to life for petty crimes. Once again, those, that deal that I'd taken years uh, prior uh, had been a big deal. Um, it came back when this three strikes law passed and uh, I was looking at, to being a candidate for that three strikes law because of those priors. Yeah, it was different for me. You know, uh, I was still addicted to drugs. I just, you know, I just kept doing the same thing I was doing years that went by. You know, I just couldn't shake it. So now I just said, told myself I was never going to carry a gun anymore. I wasn't going to put any guns in anybody's face. That's what I wasn't going to do. I wasn't going to steal anything. So I just said, I'll just sell drugs. I'll just sell drugs here, there. It didn't matter. If you had money, I'll sell it to you. And I was going to support my habit. But I sold to the wrong guy one time. He happened to be a San Jose police officer. And I sold to him multiple times. And with that, I, was, I, I just was so stuck on that. I didn't know what else to do. So I got arrested. When I got arrested, you know, you get in line, and most of the time you just, they all the petty thieves and, and, and drunk drivers are on one line, and, and that's where we were. As we're on our way into court, the bailiff stops us and says, hey, who's Chapman? I said, I'm Chapman. He said, step out. I step out. 
put handcuffs on me. Why are you putting cuffs on me? I said, because you're a three striker. I knew right then I was looking at life. You know, in, 1980, in 1995, I was arrested for taking a vehicle. And uh, two years later, I was convicted under the three strikes law. I received my 25 years to life, but at the time I didn't realize what it really meant. A couple of months later, I was sitting in San Quentin State Prison and uh, it was around Christmas time. And I recall someone was playing Christmas carols. You know, around that time, it really dawned on me that I was about to do 25 years of my life in state prison. And there came a chance that uh, I might get out, but the hope was really slim. Yeah, for me, you know, I used to call my family. I was fighting this case and I was saying, hey, I sold to him five times. I gave him some one time. I'm looking at life. They said, no, you didn't hurt anybody. There's no way. My family didn't believe me. They just thought I'd just back the line again just trying to just cheat them out. So I said, no, it's the new law, it's three strikes. I'm looking at life. I'm gonna get life for this. I said, no, you won't, there's no way. So I go in court and I'm sitting there. And I look around in the courtroom and there's nobody behind me. In the visitor section with the family, there's nobody there because none of my family believed me. It was just the judge, the DA, the bailiff, and my attorney. When I walked out of there that day, I left with six life sentences and 150 years. The first effort at reforming the Three Strikes Law came in 2004 in the form of Prop 66. It failed, and with it, a lot of dreams died. Well, I was walking across the yard. When that happened, I'll never forget it. It was dead silence. There was two suicides that day at San Quentin. For myself, I was in Ironwood State Prison. I'll always, always remember that election. There was a little bit of hope that night, myself and the rest of the inmates, we watched the elections on television. And that night we went to sleep with the polls in our favor. The next morning when we woke up and heard the news that Prop 366 had failed, I felt like someone had just socked me straight off in the stomach and just taken my win. It was around that time that I felt that, you know what, now I was gonna die in state prison, and it was a very, very ugly feeling. It would be a full eight years before another effort took hold in the form of Proposition 36, which passed handily in 2012. When it passed, it rendered thousands of inmates in California eligible for resentencing and release. In my county of practice, in Santa Clara, just over the hill, I had, uh, there were 180 people who were eligible for resentencing, and I was privileged to represent 22 of them. And it was one of the most exciting moments in my career thus far, because I was able to shepherd people through their reentry process into their communities and into their families. But it was just as devastating as I realized that a full 50% of my clients were African American in a county wherein African Americans only comprise 3% of the general population. And I was so happy they called me for legal mail. I looked up and said, Santa Clara County in the corner. I said, man, I'm actually going home. Can't believe it. I can't even open a letter. My hands are shaking. And I open up the letter and it says, you look like you might have an opportunity to be resentenced under the new three strike law. I couldn't believe it. I said, oh man, I got to go back to another public defender. That's how I got life. <laughs> I looked down at the bottom of the letter and my attorney is Jessica Delgado yeah. with a smiley face. The process of petitioning for resentencing and release involves looking at someone's California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation records. And even though that word rehabilitation is in the title of the institution, it's about anything but rehabilitation. It is, in fact, the most racialized, segregated, violent institution that exists. So I expected that for these individuals who had no reason to hope, <coughs> whose society had thrown away, that they would have given up. But instead, what I found were these inspiring personal transformations, journeys of service. And it was truly amazing and inspiring to see that. 
For Dave, he had served, at this point, 19 years of his sentence for taking a car. And what was most inspiring about him was there was so much he had done for himself, but already, well before this law was on the books, he was already mentoring at-risk youth from inside state prison. For Bilal, I got to walk into his family home, and when I walked into the living room, I saw that picture of him with the Little League team, and it resonated deeply for me because I'm the mom of a Little Leaguer. And as I looked into his records, I saw that he played for the San Quentin Giants and that that baseball identity had survived the horrors of that institution. And that was a touchstone for me in my litigation because it reminded me to remind the court and to tell you today that these people are just like you and just like me. Eight months ago, after almost 19 years, Jessica secured my release. And, you know, although there was a time when I felt that I was going to die in there, and I started mending um, my relationships with the people that I had hurt, uh, I want you to know that uh, I am very sorry for what I have done in the past. And uh, because I'm out, um, I have tried really hard to try to mend those relationships back to where they're at, especially with my two beautiful daughters. With me, I never thought I did enough to stay life in prison. I never did enough. So I just knew I had to do the things that were gonna be necessary to, to get home and be home. And if I wasn't going to get home, then I was going to make my life better or someone else's better. I don't have any children, but I took parenting classes. I went to college. I also worked as a mentor. You know, I'm looking forward to celebrating 11 years clean and sober. My life is full. My life is really full. I have a job. I have five sponsees that I'm responsible for to help them work, work through this journey. But what I want you to know is there's a lot of people with petty crimes, petty innocence, innocents that are still locked up, that should have an opportunity to come home and thrive like we are thriving. But it's up to you to help us help them. Thank you, and, and what I want you to know is that there's many children hiding underneath workbenches. What I want you to know is that there are so many stories within this story, and what you've heard today are their stories about self-transformation and individual responsibility, but what I'm interested in is our collective responsibility. I could have put up slides about how much it costs to house people in state prison because for certain, the dialogue that we're having now about prison reform and mass incarceration centers and resonates most when we talk about money. But the cost that I want to talk about is what does it mean to really sit with the reality that three out of four people in prison are people of color? Because that cost, the cost of the decimation of entire generations of people, that cost is incalculable. Thank you.
comments. Everybody Woo! in the comments. Thank you, Jim. Um, I just want to ask Jessica one question. Jessica, um, how, many, how many lifers are there who are eligible for release in California? Uh, when the law passed, there were close to 3,000, is my memory. Um, the vast majority of those people are housed or were uh, sentenced to life from Los Angeles County, which understandably has our largest concentration of the population. Unfortunately, that process in Los Angeles County has also been the slowest, and there are at least another couple, I want to say half, so maybe 1,500 people waiting for their cases just to be processed. So thank you for your work. Man by man, woman by woman, Jessica, and thank you for maintaining your humanity in a place where people decided that that had no value. But thank you. Thank you.